Vatican City, October 1998. Demanding an unprecedented examination of conscience in honor of Jubilee year 2000, Pope John Paul II summons a special panel of historians and scholars to a symposium on what he himself terms a tormented phase in the history of the church. Today, simply known as the Inquisition. To aid the panel in their research, the Pope announces the public opening of the secret archives of the Inquisition, archives that have been off limits to outside scholars for over 200 years. The 79-year-old pontiff is wrestling with one of the most crucial questions of his career. Should the Catholic Church offer an official apology for sins committed during the Inquisition? The issue is a powder keg of controversy, even among historians. I said very firmly at the meeting that in my view, this apology is unnecessary because the church was not responsible for much of the persecution we, which we have had in the European past. The church, after all, does have some responsibility historically Whatever the Roman Inquisition did wrong, um, it's impossible to say that it wasn't the papacy who did it. All scholars of the Inquisition must face a central disturbing question. How did an institution of the church become the instrument by which thousands of human lives were destroyed over the course of six centuries? The answer begins with the understanding that there never was one single all-powerful inquisition, but rather separate institutions in Spain, Portugal, and Italy. What they all shared was a dark, abiding fear, the fear of religious heresy. Eleven hundred A.D the heart of the Dark Ages. A loose alliance of kingdoms and provinces known as the Holy Roman Empire make up most of the area we know today as modern Europe. In the nearly 800 years since the Roman King Constantine converted to Christianity, the religion once considered an insurrectionist sect is now the only legal faith pervading all levels of personal, social, and political life. Latin European Christianity symbolizes not only a civilizing force in a barbaric world, but also the promise of salvation after death. Clergy and citizens alike live in fear of God's harsh judgment. Still, there are dissidents who dare to challenge sacred Christian doctrine. The church labels such rebels as sinners or heretics. Simply being wrong about church dogma doesn't make you a heretic because there's lots of church dogma. But what makes you as a heretic is being wrong, informed by the appropriate church authorities that you're wrong, and then persisting in that error in the face of authority. The word heresy comes from the Latin heresis, which means simply choice. By the 12th century, heresy has a much more dire meaning. It is a mortal threat to society and to mankind, treason against God. According to civil law, criminals convicted of treason are punished with death and their goods are confiscated. With how much more reason then should they who offend Jesus, son of the Lord our God, be cut off from the Christian communion and stripped of their goods? Pope Innocent III. Despite the church's strong stand on this crime, free-thinking groups continue to emerge, insisting on interpreting God's message in their own ways. Among them are the Waldensians, itinerant preachers who wander through southern France and northern Italy, living lives of apostolic poverty. The appeal of the Waldensians seems to have been their argument for a simplified view of Christianity. The ability of anyone to preach if inspired by the Spirit, whether a cleric or not. The church insists that anyone preaching publicly must be licensed by the local bishop. 
When the Waldensians refuse to give up preaching, Pope Lucius III issues an edict known as a papal bull, condemning the movement as heretical and excommunicating its followers. Heresy was considered a threat to the Christian community. It was uh, something that would disturb the people, and not only disturb the people, disturb society, but it would alienate them from the faith. That's why it was so important to fight this. The Waldensians are mild compared to the more radical heretics, the Cathars. Cathars consider theirs to be the only true religion and remain openly hostile to the established church, which they consider evil. Cathars call their priests perfecti, or good Christians. Vowed to a life of strict abstinence, they cannot lie, swear oaths, eat animal flesh, or engage in sexual intercourse. As critics accuse the organized church and its clergy of more and more abuses of clerical power, the austerity of the Cathar perfecti seems extremely attractive by comparison. In that sense, it is an embarrassment for the church to have a group who are earnestly living in accordance with the life of Christ and his apostles as compared to a church of, run by lawyers and great administrators who live like great princes. By the 13th century, Europe is a hotbed of heresy. In southern France, Catharism flourishes. Tensions escalate until Cathar conspirators murder a papal representative preaching in the Languedoc region in 1208. Outraged, Pope Innocent III calls for a new kind of crusade, one against heretics. He essentially called on the nobility of northern France to go down to the south of France, turn out local nobles who were not persecuting Catharism, take over and create the conditions in which Catharism could be stamped out of the countryside. The Pope calls his war against fellow Christians the Albigensian Crusade after the French cathedral town of Albi. The atrocities committed by his northern crusaders become legendary. Cathar perfecti, easily identified in their black robes, are executed on the spot. Uh, perfecti didn't camouflage themselves, partly because, remember, death would release them from this terrible material world into which the bad god had, had plunged them. Uh, there is a, a self-conscious tendency, at least, toward martyrdom. However, after years of bloodshed, the sly perfecti decide to shed their distinctive garb and gradually slip underground. Though celibate, they even begin traveling with women, claiming them as their wives. Now Pope Innocent III is left with the same conundrum with which he started. The purpose of the church is to spread salvation, and a dead heretic is no good to anyone but the devil. The troubled pontiff considers the judicial system of his day. The usual procedure, accusatorial, forces the wronged party to make an accusation in public. If the accuser fails to prove his case, he is punished in the same way the accused would have been. This process makes even legitimate accusers reluctant to step forward. Innocent III realizes these rules won't serve his long-term purposes. In 1215, the Pope calls the world's Latin Christian leaders together for the Fourth Lateran Council in Rome. Innocent uses the summit to announce his new legal guidelines for the prosecution of heretics and wayward clergy. Thus, the Inquisition is born. The inquisitorial system was a wonderful innovation, and it's very much like uh, the grand jury in our system coming up with probable cause coming up with an indictment. They do not have to have proof. They just have to have enough belief or enough evidence that this person may be guilty. Innocent's inquisitorial process empowers an investigator to build an entire case by secretly collecting the opinions of people in the community. By 1231, 
Pope Gregory IX puts out a call for the appointment of special agents termed inquisitors of heretical depravity to take on this new job. Pope Innocent III had failed to wipe out the Cathars, a sect of heretics operating in southern France. Nevertheless, in 1231, his successor, Pope Gregory IX, institutes a plan to turn the full force of the new inquisitorial legal process against them. The Pope appoints a handful of priests and friars as inquisitors and sends them into the German and French countryside to root out religious criminals. Those heretics who refuse to recant their beliefs and continue to preach them will be burned at the stake. Remember, if they failed, the heretics all would go to hell. The purpose of, of all of this is to save as many people as possible. But there are certain things that have to be done if lots of people are to be saved. Pope Gregory soon learns that a good inquisitor is hard to find. The most enthusiastic are often fanatical and out of control. Conrad of Marburg, the most notorious of these early inquisitors, convinces Gregory IX that he has uncovered a secret German sect called Luciferians. Conrad's method of operation includes recruiting a lynch mob, arresting the suspected heretics, then offering them a choice, recant or be burned alive. Historians will discover that the Luciferians are pure fiction, an obsessive fantasy of Conrad's created to impress the Pope. The papal inquisitor in northern France is no better. A converted Cathar, Robert Le Bougre, rounds up groups of suspected heretics and holds boisterous public trials. In one devastating event, 183 Cathars are interrogated, sentenced, and burned alive in a single day. After years of outcry from French bishops, the Pope finally realizes that Robert is a dangerous extremist, removes him from office, and imprisons him. Something had to be done, and, and there had to be somebody better at it than these ad hoc, personally devout but utterly incompetent uh, and dangerous very dangerous people. And, and that is the moment when Gregory IX turns to the Dominican order. Founded by St. Dominic in 1216, Dominicans are well suited to the job of inquisitor. Educated as theologians, they are accustomed to life on the road and to preaching against heresy. By the mid-13th century, Gregory IX sends forth dozens of Dominican inquisitors to seek out and prosecute Cathars, Waldensians, and other heretical groups. The pontiff formally announces to his bishops the coming of the inquisitors to the burgs and villages of France, Italy, Germany, and Spain. We enjoin that you receive them kindly and treat them with honor by giving them such good advice, aid, and support in this office, and in other respects, that they may be able to carry out the task entrusted to them. Gregory IX is asking for much more in this letter than mere hospitality from his bishops. In their quest for heretics, the papal inquisitors will need to rely on inside information, rumors and other intelligence gathered by an informal network of clerical informants working as spies. Probably their best eyes and ears in the countryside were the parish clergy, because these are people who you know, live in the villages, have relatives in the village, have their ears open for local gossip. Like the hanging judges of the Old West, the inquisitors ride into town, usually accompanied by a notary or scribe to document the proceedings, perhaps a servant or bodyguard. The local priest gathers the townspeople together to hear their visitor preach on the sins and dangers of heresy. Once his sermon is finished, the Inquisitor announces a period of grace when anyone who might be guilty of heresy can make a full confession and be assured of lenient treatment. 
A person who thought he might be named or who had been a heretic and was having second thoughts had to operate within the period of grace because if you, if you confessed after the period of grace, say after you were aware an investigation of you had begun, that would count as being not as sincere uh, a confession as if you had made it during the period of grace. A few weeks later, the Inquisitor announces that the grace period is over and the more ominous edict of faith phase is about to begin. From this day forward, any accused person becomes subject to interrogation or arrest. And since all testimony is given in secret, the Inquisitor encourages all good citizens to denounce any neighbors they might suspect to be heretics. The purpose of the general inquisitions and the edicts of grace and edicts of faith were to get as many people out into the office of the inquisitors as possible. And so they did use fear, they used terror, they used uh, self-interest. The inquisitor must have incriminating testimony from at least two witnesses before he can move forward. Sometimes the targets of investigations have no idea they are in trouble until the day they are summoned. Much of the evidence in inquisitorial procedure takes place before you know that there's an investigation going on. When you're brought in, that investigation is just about completed. I mean, it's quite, it's quite opposite from a modern criminal trial. Realizing the danger of false or malicious accusations, the inquisitors do make an attempt to weed out lies from truth. When the accused is first brought forward, he or she is asked to list all enemies. If those names match any on the witness list, the Inquisitor is supposed to disregard that testimony. But the legal protections end there. The accused never learns the actual names of his accusers or even the specifics of the accusation. It was very difficult to prove your innocence once the Inquisitors have gotten hold of you. Even suspects who confess to heresy can't be reconciled with the church until they give names and information about other suspected heretics. If the accused balks, he risks a prison sentence and seizure of all his property. If you're being uncooperative, the inquisitors may reduce your food ration, they may chain you to the walls. So the primary mechanism for getting people to confess is simply to lock them away for protracted periods of time to have them think things over. How do these inquisitors go about their very secretive work? Some how-to manuals have survived, providing a fascinating historical glimpse into this era. One, called The Conduct of Inquiry Concerning Heretical Depravity, was written by retired inquisitor Bernard Guy in 1324. Guy, whose exploits provided inspiration for the historical novel and film The Name of the Rose, presents dozens of case studies representing 17 years of first-hand experience in what he calls his personal crusade against heresy. The purpose of the Inquisition is to destroy heresy. And to destroy heresy, we must destroy heretics. Bernard Guy, 1324. The Inquisitors really do think of themselves as a combat organization. They're quite aware that there are heretics and their sympathizers out there at large in the countryside, and they are highly motivated to get rid of them. A later book, Directorium Inquisitorium, was written in 1376 by Inquisitor Nicholas Eimerick of Aragon. It describes the commitment and tenacity required of a 14th or 15th century Inquisitor and even includes a handy list of clever tricks used to fool suspects into confessing. And one that I found very chilling was that when you sit there holding a little piece of parchment in your lap, looking down at it and checking it as the person gives you his testimony, and eventually you can say, well, no, no, what you're telling me can't be true. I can see plainly that you're not telling me the truth. And what the suspect under interrogation thinks is you've got a copy of somebody else's deposition when you simply got a blank piece of parchment. There was a powerful incentive on the part of sincere uh, inquisitors to um, get to the truth any way that they could. 
And if they were to ride roughshod over some rights of other defendants, well, that was just something that had to be done in order to get to the truth. There is another chilling aspect to the Inquisitor's job, torture. In the Middle Ages, it is considered an acceptable form of lie detection when there is enough other evidence to justify it. When we think of torture in the 20th century, we refer to a violent physical form to make people tell the truth. At that time, it was a way to verify if the accused was telling the truth. And that's initially the role of torture. It's a legal instrument that comes into play at a certain time in, in, in a case and under very specific circumstances. Before 1252, the church prohibits inquisitors from using torture in their work. But after Cathar sympathizers murder the inquisitor Peter Martyr in Lombardy, Pope Innocent IV opens the floodgates, loosing secular legal methods, particularly torture, into the fight against heresy. The official or rector should obtain from all heretics he has captured a confession by torture for they are indeed thieves and murderers of souls. Pope Innocent IV. So this was not something that the heresy inquisitors invented. They were just following, in that case, they were following the rule of law. Two types of prisoners are targeted for torture. Those who refuse to recant and those who seem to know more than they are telling. Inquisitors select the method of torture, but they leave the actual hands-on performance to professional torturers, experts at inflicting pain. First of all, the torture had to be described to the person. Then the instruments of torture had to be shown to the person. And after about three or four of these steps, do you actually get one form or another of torture actually applied? So that at any moment, the defendant could say, I've had enough of this. The strappato is the late Middle Ages and Renaissance era's most popular instrument of torture. The accused's hands are bound behind his back and attached to a rope hanging over a beam in the ceiling. Sometimes weights are added to the victim's feet. Once hoisted into the air, the prisoner is lowered then quickly raised again or jerked violently. Leg screws and shin vices are more mechanically sophisticated devices for causing pain. With every turn of the screw, more and more excruciating pressure is applied to the prisoner's legs. In the midst of such mayhem, the Inquisitor's notary carefully and faithfully records the events of the session, ready to take down a confession if or when it is uttered. The clergy rationalize all this as an act of benevolence. After all, if torture leads to a confession, then the offender can finally reconcile with God and receive salvation. So if a confession was made under torture, then the process was to uh, take away the instruments of torture and allow for recovery and to put the question to the defendant again to see if the defendant was only induced by the fear of pain to make this confession or whether the defendant was actually telling the truth. With all these methods at their disposal, it is not surprising that the conviction rate of medieval inquisitors is almost 90%. Could heresy have really been that widespread? Or were the inquisitors using their power to frighten people into false confessions? One of the great problems with dealing with the inquisitorial records, I think, is determining whether you can believe anything that's in them at all. Because the inquisitors, if they wanted to, could get people to confess to almost anything. All through the 13th and 14th century, papal inquisitors wend their way through parts of southern Europe, collecting accusations and investigating heretics. These priests see themselves as God's frontline soldiers in the war to save souls, but they leave behind a battlefield littered with casualties. Inquisition frightens citizens into turning on their friends and neighbors, tearing families apart, and turning peaceful communities into rumor mills of lies and suspicions. 
Throughout all the Holy Roman Empire and kingdoms and principalities of Europe, townspeople wait in dread for the Sermo Generalis, the judgment phase of the Inquisition process. Punishments or penances vary from public scourging to imprisonment or forced labor. In many cases, convicted heretics are ordered to wear distinctive clothing that announces their shame to the public. Typically what they wore on their clothing was a yellow cross, one on the front of their clothing and one on their back. And this was to be worn at all times when they were out of doors. It was not to be obscured by other clothing. And if it wore out, it was supposed to be replaced. Those branded with the yellow cross become pariahs in the community. But their fate is mild in comparison to the penances suffered by relapsed heretics. Those who recant then go back to their old ways. Their punishment is execution. Canon law forbids members of the clergy to participate in any judgment of blood, so inquisitors get around this rule by handing condemned heretics over to the secular authorities. The inquisitors shed some crocodile tears and say some words that they hope that the secular authorities will display clemency towards these people. But the thorough expectation is that they're going to be burned. When those judged guilty of heresy have been given up to the civil power by the Inquisition, the chief magistrate of the city shall take them at once and shall within five days at the most execute the laws made against them. Pope Innocent IV, 1252. Upon completion of the Sermo Generalis judgment, secular authorities escort the condemned to a location outside the city gates. Here, they tie them to tall wooden stakes set amidst tons of kindling wood. Inquisitors themselves never attend these executions. You were allowed to make your last confession to a confessor if you wished to, but because you were now in the, in the custody of the secular arm, as it were, you couldn't do anything to save yourself from them because they had an absolute charge to execute you. Burning at the stake is one of the most horrific death sentences imaginable. It might take hours for the condemned to be completely consumed by the flames. If the victim is lucky or his loved ones influential enough, there is enough fresh wet wood in the pile to generate plenty of smoke. Death by asphyxiation is preferable to the slow agony of roasting alive. Even death can't protect you from the clutches of the Inquisition. Sometimes people who have passed away years before are posthumously accused and condemned as heretics. Their graves are pillaged and their remains added to the bonfires. Tragically for the surviving family, the worst is yet to come. Secular authorities immediately confiscate the property of the dead heretics leaving spouses and children destitute, regardless of their own religious faithfulness. The morning after an execution often brings with it relic collectors, scavengers bearing sacks who comb the ashes for pieces of the corpses. In most cases, they are neither ghouls nor madmen. Usually, they are among the few who believe those executed to be true martyrs, deserving of veneration. Many people went away thinking, well, the heretics are good Christians and the inquisitors are evil people, so they could backfire. By the 14th century, the Inquisition's campaign against heresy has reached its peak. At the height of its powers, the church deals just as harshly with perceived treason from within its own ranks. When an offshoot of the Franciscan order breaks away, calling themselves spiritual Franciscans, and charging their order with abandoning the ideals of their founder, St. Francis of Assisi, Pope John XXII orders the Inquisition to crack down on them. With the burning of four of the spiritual Franciscan leaders in Marseille in 1317, most of the remaining rebels are persuaded to return to the fold. Within 150 years of Gregory IX's call for a papal Inquisition, the most prominent heretical movements, the Cathars and the Waldensians, 
have been virtually eradicated from Western Europe. With fewer heretics to prosecute, it seems as if the Inquisition might die out altogether. The business of hunting down and punishing witches brings the process back to life with a vengeance by the 14th century. It is linked to heresy by the concept that in order to gain his powers, the sorcerer must renounce God and his baptism. That is, he must break a contract and he must pay some kind of homage to the devil in order to get those powers. The devil doesn't give you something for nothing. The earliest sorcery cases are tainted by politics. In 1307, France is nearly bankrupt after a series of failed wars. Her king, Philip the Fair, becomes envious of the riches and property possessed by the Knights Templar, a powerful and influential order of warrior monks formed during the first Holy Land Crusade. King Philip charges them with sorcery, and over the next seven years, thousands of Templars throughout Europe are tortured, imprisoned, or burned at the stake. There are no modern historians who think that the Templars were objectively guilty of what they were accused of, of sodomy, devil worship, heresy, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is a really cynical manipulation of the process by Philip. It is one of the sort of more chilling examples of how the inquisitorial proceedings could be perverted. A hundred years later, fresh from her triumph over the English at Orléans, Joan of Arc is captured and imprisoned by enemies fearful of her growing political power. They hand her over to an ad hoc inquisitorial tribunal, using it as a convenient weapon against her. Joan's accusers insist that the voices she claims as her inspiration are those of the devil and that her premonitions are witchcraft. She is convicted and dies in fiery agony. This new heresy of diabolical witchcraft seems so dangerous to both inquisitors and secular authorities, it spawns the most notorious and influential how-to manual of them all. Published in 1486, Malleus Maleficarum, the Hammer of Witches, lays out theological support, legal advice, and various techniques for accusing, torturing, and sentencing witches. It lives in infamy as the document that creates the archetypical image of the female witch and as one of the most overtly woman-hating works in all of world literature. When a woman thinks alone, she thinks only evil. Since they are feebler in mind and body, it is not surprising they should come more under the spell of witchcraft. Our witchcraft comes from a kind of lust, which in women is insatiable. Malleus Maleficarum. History has proven that one of Malleus Maleficarum's authors, an inquisitor named Heinrich Kramer, had some problems controlling his own insatiable carnal lusts. In 1485, he was charged with conducting an inquisition in the city of, or region of Innsbruck in what is now Austria. He got himself into a lot of trouble because most of the people he interrogated were women and what he interrogated them about was mostly their sexual activities. Alarmed at Kramer's overt sexual obsession, the local bishop orders the inquisitor removed and all his prisoners released. Two years later, the, the Malleus Maleficarum comes out. It goes directly, apparently, out of Kramer's frustration with the Innsbruck experience and uh, this furious misogyny that he has. Over the next 200 years, Malleus Maleficarum becomes a bestseller, going to press in four different languages. It is destined to become a major inspiration for the secular, Catholic, and Protestant witch hunters who will terrorize Europe and North America during the 17th and 18th centuries. By the 15th century, with no new policy or vision from the papacy, the Inquisition gradually begins to die out. For the most part, Inquisitions were only active if a particular Inquisitor wanted to pursue heresy. If a particular Inquisitor wasn't interested, then nothing happened. And so the tribunals run out of steam. 
The plight of European Jews during the medieval period has always been a desperate one. Expelled from nation after nation, many eventually settle in Spain from the fourth century onward. Here they prosper, living and working in relative harmony with both Muslims and Christians. But by the end of the 14th century, a series of economic and social upheavals stir up age-old prejudices. In the 1380s and 90s, anti-Jewish riots lead to the burning of synagogues and the massacre of Jews by the thousands. The Spanish government's desperate solution is to order its Jews to leave Spain forever or convert to Christianity. Many choose to leave, but others, weary of the ceaseless persecution, opt to give up the religion of their ancestors in order to stay in Mother Spain. The uh, mass conversion of Jews in, the, in 1391 in Spain was almost unique in Jewish history. Very rarely had uh, so great a number of Jews converted at once along with their rabbis, along with their uh, wealthy. It left the population of Jews of Spain shrunken. Due at least in part to their ancient cultural ethics of scholarship and persistent hard work, these new Christians called conversos thrive in the decades that follow. As Jews, it had been illegal for them to hold certain jobs or positions in government, but now, as full Christians, opportunities abound. Very, very early on in the history of the conversions of Jews, we have conversos who are bishops, conversos who are ministers of state, conversos who are leading financiers. We have conversos holding the most prominent positions in Christian society because that is the advantage of converting. And it is precisely that which, of course, might give rise to objections from other Christians who resent the rise to prominence of these people who were formerly Jews. Within a few generations, forces within the Spanish Catholic Church begin to charge that these new Christians are secretly practicing the Jewish religion while maintaining a convenient front of Catholicism. This phenomenon, known as Judaizing, has some basis in fact, since certain conversos, though self-proclaimed Christians, do indeed retain certain customs passed down from their ancestors. The bulk of the so-called Judaizing activity was more cultural than it was a matter of belief. In other words, it was the practice of things that they're parents and grandparents had practiced in which they saw nothing particularly wrong with, like lighting Sabbath candles. A lot of them felt there was nothing inherently conflicting with Catholicism to light Sabbath candles. The Conversos' new status as baptized Christians also means that any perception of a backslide into Judaism leaves them open to charges of heresy, and it is this tragic irony that leads to their downfall. With the marriage in 1469 of Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile, the two most powerful kingdoms on the Spanish peninsula unite. Her Dominican advisors quickly convince Isabella, a devout Catholic, that the problem of secret Judaizing is a mortal threat to the unity of the Spanish nation and that an inquisition may be the only solution. If clergy are demanding an inquisition, it is not simply because they are fanatical, but because they know very well that behind them there are many supporters, many of their faithful, who are also conscious of a problem as they perceive it. King Ferdinand, a wily political schemer, sees that an alliance with the Roman Catholic Church can profit Spain in many ways. There was probably another agenda on uh, Ferdinand's mind, and uh, that was how could he get his hands on the wealth of these uh, converts. There was a huge amount of money that was waiting locked up in the coffers of wealthy uh, convert merchants and nobility, and Ferdinand set out to get his hands on that, and he did. King Ferdinand's first step is to contact the Pope and express his concern over Spain's Jewish problem. 
Great harm is suffered by the Christians from the contact, intercourse, and communications which they have with the Jews, who always attempt in various ways to seduce faithful Christians from the Holy Catholic faith. King Ferdinand. Under pressure from Spain's persistent king, Pope Sixtus IV issues a papal bull calling for an inquisition to stamp out heretical depravity in Spain, aimed at Jewish conversos. This new Spanish inquisition is worlds apart from all inquisitorial tribunals that have come before. Its rules ensure that King Ferdinand, and not the Pope, controls every aspect of its activities. The Supreme Court of the Inquisition, called the Suprema, contains six or seven men personally appointed by the king. Only one member, the Inquisitor General, receives official appointment by the Pope, but even he has to be nominated by Ferdinand first. Although you and the others enjoy the title Inquisitor, it is I and the Queen who have appointed you, and without our support, you can do very little. King Ferdinand. That means that the power of the state starts to have in the Spanish Inquisition a certain right of control on the institution that didn't exist in the Middle Ages. On February 6, 1481, the first auto de fe ceremony, translation, act of faith, commences in Seville. At this event, which will become the trademark of the Spanish Inquisition, over 100 converso men and women accused of secretly practicing the Jewish faith are judged before the church and state. Six pay the ultimate price by being burned at the stake. At the heart of the auto was always a sermon. And the Dominicans would select their finest orator, the one with the strongest voice, and uh, sometimes these sermons would go on for half an hour, an hour, two hours. The uh, participants are stripped of all their dignity. Their heads are shaved. That includes women as well as men. Men's beards are taken off, and in the case of Spain, a man's virility resided in his beard, so it was a very unpleasant thing to do to him. The idea behind the ceremony was, uh, at all times, to uh, humiliate the uh, penitents and to uh, show uh, the congregation uh, what the penalty was for engaging in heresy. Uh, even people who didn't have much education and weren't interested in theological niceties uh, and weren't even sure of the, of the creeds that they repeated or the prayers that they said, they knew what was going on at a properly staged auto de fe. It was a terrifying spectacle meant to set limits in people's minds about what they could say, what they could think, what they could believe. Within a year of its establishment, 1,500 conversos accused of Judaizing have been brought to trial and hundreds more are condemned to death. The number of people who were burned to death at one time uh, was, even by present-day standards, staggering. You'd have 28 people burnt at one time. You'd have 70 people burnt at one time. And in the largest auto that was ever held, 109 people were put on the stake at once. Unlike most medieval heretics who dared to preach their ideas in public, secret Judaizing was by definition a clandestine activity taking place behind closed doors. And neighbors could then, if they saw someone uh, looking at a small book, which could be the Book of Hours, they could say, I saw this individual reading a book and I believe it's a Jewish book. I heard uh, somebody mumbling a prayer, I'm sure it's a, a Jewish prayer. So lighting candles, bathing, washing clothing, butchering meat, preparing meat for the table, eating meat on a day of fish, such as a Friday or a Wednesday, could land you in big trouble if your neighbors happened to notice and if they had a grudge against you. Accusations bring on more accusations. Some conversos actually come forward to denounce themselves, hoping to clear their record by beating their enemies to the punch. But a light penance can only be earned with a full confession, and that means naming names of fellow heretics. The only way you could get out of it was to 
pick names of others in the community. And this is, of course, so reminiscent in our own country of the 1950s and the Great Red Scare involving the House on American Activities Committee. And this is where so many tragedies happen. People who were innocent of anything, this convert might under torture or threat of death give out names of just about anybody just to escape. If Ferdinand and Isabella receive credit as the architects of the Spanish Inquisition, their building contractor must certainly be Tomás Torquemada, the first inquisitor general. From the 1490s onwards, he very carefully drew up systematically rules which we still have in print to guide the inquisitors down to the smallest detail as to what they could or could not do, what they should or should not do. And as a result of this, he can rightly be considered the founder of the Inquisition. There is no question that Torque Mada presides over the Inquisition during its bloodiest period and clearly exerts plenty of influence over the crown. Although he's been portrayed as everything from a Svengali-like madman to a sinister, sex-crazed monk, historians know very little about the man. You know, he was typical of the theologians who were very fanatical and very uh, anti-Jewish, extremely hostile to the universos. And he's a man who um, I think epitomized that kind of intolerance and ferocity and that was so characteristic of those early inquisitors. You might not agree with him that Judaizers should be prosecuted and convicted, but uh, in my view, Torquemada was very insistent on the uh, rules of due process for the inquisitorial system. Nevertheless, conservative estimates indicate that during Torquemada's 20-year tenure as Inquisitor General, 2,000 people lose their lives and thousands more are punished. Within five years of its birth, the Spanish Inquisition is in full swing and earning its fearsome reputation. The Spanish conversos, Jews who have converted to Catholicism, have nowhere to turn for justice. Both church and secular authorities follow the same pretzel logic. All conversos who flee from the Inquisition are, by implication, guilty. All who come forward to denounce themselves are, by their own admission, guilty. And those who are tried and condemned are, of course, guilty. The inner workings of the Inquisition's court are kept private and its records carefully guarded even from the crown. When the Spanish Inquisition arrests someone, that person simply disappears into prison until the Inquisition finishes with him or her. Family and friends left to wait and worry are powerless to help. The Spaniards made a true fetish of this, El Secreto. I mean, this is one of their fundamental principles that uh, the prestige of the institution uh, was felt to depend in fair measure on keeping secrecy intact. For the accused, the surreal, almost arbitrary nature of the process compounds the terror. There is no trial, rather a series of audiences after which the prisoner returns to his cell. During this ordeal, which can go on for weeks or months, the accused may never learn the crimes of which he is accused. He is constantly urged, sometimes under threat of torture, to confess. And so the accused person would have to make their own excuses without knowing the nature of the denunciations directed against them. And this would often lead to extensive imprisonment of prisoners who would refuse to confess because they felt there was nothing to confess and they might well have been right. On September 15th, 1485, some enraged conversos finally decide to take justice into their own hands. As Inquisitor Pedro Arbues kneels before the altar at the Cathedral of Saragossa, eight assassins attack him with knives. Arbues dies the next day and with him the hopes of Spanish conversos everywhere. For the misguided plot turns public sympathy away from the conversos forever and guarantees the Inquisition a place in Spanish society for generations to come. 
Among modern scholars, one obvious question has led to more debate than any other. Were the conversos truly practicing the Jewish religion in secret, or were they simply scapegoats of bigotry? The problem from a technical point of view is that almost the only evidence we possess to answer that question comes from the Holy Office itself. And therefore, the issue is, do you implicitly trust the motives of the Holy Office, who investigated people for Judaizing, or do you believe that this was fundamentally a fraud, huge exaggeration based on perjured testimony, etc.? Urged on by Inquisitor General Torquemada, in March of 1492, King Ferdinand issues another edict of expulsion. Jews are given four months to accept baptism or leave Spain. In the months that follow, nearly half Spain's Jewish population, an estimated 40,000 people, take flight. The rest remain and convert to Christianity. And they just fall into the trap which had been set for their fellow Jews a, a century before. So the Jews gain nothing by converting. The social situation does not change at all. If anything, it gets worse for people of Jewish origin. Do not grieve over your departure, for you have to drink down your death in one gulp, whereas we have to stay behind among these wicked people, receiving death from them every day. Juan de Leon, Spanish Jewish Converso. In 1499, the expulsion order extends to include all the unconverted Muslims of Spain. Over the next 25 years, a series of rebellions, expulsions, and forced baptisms result in another class of newly converted Christian, the Moriscos. What we have here, therefore, is exactly the same scenario as with the conversos. Here we have people who were of another culture and religion and are now theoretically Christians. This is obviously a tailor-made case for the Inquisition to go in and, and try and sort these people out and make them practice Christianity correctly. Prosecution of Moriscos triple over the next 100 years. Nevertheless, they cannot or will not assimilate. Finally, in 1609, the Spanish government concludes that the Moriscos are beyond conversion and simply expels them all. The hatred of the Spanish Inquisition is at least as intense among Muslims as it is among Jews. In its attempts to enshrine Catholicism as Spain's only national religion, the Spanish Inquisition imprisons innocent citizens, confiscates property, destroys families, and puts thousands of people to death. What it did little of, according to historians, is the thing for which it has become so famous, torture. One of the things that has been firmly established by the New Inquisition scholarship is precisely that torture was used very, very sparingly by the Inquisition. Torture is used to elicit a confession, purely and simply. And once the confession is there, the torture stops. The inquisitors get very angry when their subordinates torture individuals who are too old, too sick, dying of leprosy, suspected of mental illness, and the like. They don't want those individuals tortured, and they don't torture children. No matter how infrequent, the Spanish have precise rules for their torture. Prisoners, male and female, remain naked throughout the session with only a small cloth to cover their private parts. Now, not all the clergy of the day were celibate, and not all of those who were celibate could be able to look on a scene like this over and over again and feel no a twinge of sadism, no twinge of a sexual satisfaction. To say that this could go on century after century is to completely misunderstand the nature of human sexuality. The garucha, the Spanish version of the medieval strapado, becomes the most common torture. The rack, probably the most famous of all torture devices, is also effective, but it does have some drawbacks. It could not be used extensively because a cardinal rule of torture was that the Inquisition could not shed blood, so blood never had to be shed. 
If at any stage blood was shed, the torture had to be stopped. The toca, or water torture, becomes a favorite of the Spanish inquisitors. During this nightmarish ordeal, the prisoner's mouth is held forcibly open while a strip of cloth is lowered down the throat. Then a slow stream of water pours down the throat, saturating the cloth and causing the prisoner to gag violently. Under the Spanish Inquisition, torture could not be administered more than three times and never for more than 15 minutes per session. Statements made by prisoners under torture are not legal unless repeated 24 hours later away from the torture chamber. Inquisitors do break the rules, but some do it out of ignorance rather than malevolence. The good judge must take no notice of the screams, cries, sighs, tremblings, or pain of the accused, and all torture must be done with such care and moderation that the accused be neither driven mad, wounded, hurt, nor unduly distressed. J. Damhuder, torture eyewitness. They were told to follow what was in the rule book, and that was all. I haven't, to be perfectly honest with you, found very much evidence of bending the rules. I mean, they may have been more willing to obey the procedures than the New York City cops. The Spanish Inquisition initiates a few innovations in the area of punishment. The yellow cross of the heretic attached to the clothing in the Middle Ages evolves into a garment called a San Benito. These robes must be worn at the judgment ceremony known as the auto de fe, or act of faith, then later over street clothes for as long as the penance decrees. As you can imagine, people walking through the streets would be the target of snide remarks, children would throw stones at you and such, made it very difficult for you to earn your living. Even death does not free a heretic from shame. The ceremonial robes of deceased heretics are hung up in the local parish church to remind everybody in town that this person and his or her family are connected with heresy. Death and humiliation are not the only pitfalls of the Spanish Inquisition. One of its most feared punishments is becoming a slave on the Spanish galleys. This penalty is thought to have been the brainchild of King Ferdinand himself. It has nothing to do with religion or heresy or anything else. But when King Ferdinand realized that many of these people were being punished, usually to totally useless punishments, he thought, great idea, why not use these guys? Because I need people to row my ships. Next to death, being sent to the galleys is the most dreaded punishment of the Spanish Inquisition. I can think of almost nothing worse than being a galley slave myself. I almost would rather be burned, at least you get it over with. During the expulsion of 1492, thousands of Jews flee over the border into Portugal, swelling the Jewish population there and stirring up age-old racial tensions. In the resulting turmoil, Portuguese Jews are forced to convert to Christianity, and by 1532, King João III insists that Portugal have its own inquisition. For 10 years, wealthy Portuguese conversos use every form of persuasion possible, including enormous cash bribes, to convince the Pope not to bring the inquisition to their new sanctuary. Many of the Spanish converts then came racing into Portugal, and in fact, they soon outnumber the Portuguese community, thinking that they'll be safe there until, of course, the Portuguese uh, institute uh, their own inquisition, and then it goes the other way. The Portuguese inquisition quickly sets to work against the usual suspects. Between 1547 and 1580, 34 auto de fe judgment ceremonies take place in Portugal, with almost 2,000 penitents and 169 executions. The persecutions are so deadly that conversos, many of whom have only recently immigrated to Portugal from Spain, choose to move back to their homeland and face what seems to be the lesser of two evil institutions. 
After the Spanish military conquest of the Aztec Empire by Cortes in 1521, Conversos and Jews from Portugal and Spain soon immigrate to the Americas in hopes of a fresh start. But the Spanish Inquisition is right behind and sets up operations in newly founded Mexico City. In 1528, two Spanish Conversos are burnt at the stake in the first auto de fe ceremony on New World soil. The first waves of priests from Spain also consider it their holy duty to lead the Native Americans away from their pagan beliefs and to embrace Christianity. After an initially optimistic period of what they thought was widespread conversion, the second generation of Spanish prelates in the New World began to have second thoughts that, that perhaps Indians were remaining crypto-Indians after being baptized, just as conversos were thought to be crypto-Jews after baptism. In surprising contrast to its own strict policy against equally reluctant Jews and Muslims in Spain, the Suprema eventually decides that the Indians are simply incapable of absorbing Christian beliefs and are thus beyond conversion. At the same time as the Spanish and Portuguese inquisitions are completing their scourge of Muslim and Jewish heretics, a new threat appears on the horizon. In the year 1517, a German priest named Martin Luther posts his famous treatise, The 95 Theses, on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. It is a scathing attack on the Catholic Church. Is it not true that there is nothing under the vast heavens more corrupt, more pestilential, more hateful than the court of Rome? She who was formerly the gate of heaven is now a sort of open mouth of hell, Martin Luther. The charismatic Luther's outcry snowballs into a full-scale religious revolution. The Reformation movement takes Europe by storm. By 1550, the crowns of Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Finland all have embraced the new faith called Protestantism. The Pope is enraged. The way in which we in this country back in the 50s and 60s regarded the Soviet threat would be very similar to the way in which in Rome at that time they would have considered the Protestant threat. With its busy seaports and extensive European trade network, it is only a matter of time before Protestant ideas begin flowing into Catholic Spain. In 1557, two separate groups of wealthy Protestant converts are discovered and arrested in Seville and Valladolid. These arrests in the late 1550s are horrific to the inquisitorial administration and to royal government, because many of the suspects are very highly placed in governmental bureaucracy. The discovery of organized Protestants in two of Spain's major cities sends shockwaves through the Catholic nation. Spain's king, Charles V, has spent the previous 30 years battling Protestantism in Germany, and he calls for a swift and ruthless crackdown. His ally in Rome, Pope Paul IV, throws the entire weight of the church behind the anti-Protestant effort. He issues an extraordinary papal bull that actually permits the Spanish Holy Office to execute first-time offenders, even those who have repented. So far as I'm aware, these are the only cases in the entire histories of the Spanish or Roman or Portuguese inquisitions where first offenders who declared that they were repentant of their doctrinal errors were nonetheless put to death. Anti-Protestant fever infects all the major cities of Spain. Among those burned at the stake are priests, nuns, English soldiers, and even three children who go to their deaths alongside their mother. Less than three years after the first discovery of Protestants in Spain, Protestantism is literally burnt out of existence. They never appear again. Spain is in the curious position of uh, not having Protestants. The bloody Protestant crackdown between 1559 and 1562 also marks the zenith of the auto de fe ceremony in terms of attendance, pomp, 
and pure theatricality. In anticipation of the sentencing of hundreds of Protestant heretics, Inquisitor General Fernando de Valdez deliberately sets out to revamp the auto de fe in a grandiose new way. The cost mounted astronomically, they bankrupted the inquisitorial tribunals so they could hold fewer and fewer of them. And so they started to collect prisoners to save them up so that they would be a, a really good auto and enough people uh, to burn after the ceremonies. Spain had systematically eliminated its own Protestants, but inquisitors remain ever vigilant against the threat of heretics from abroad. Throughout the 16th century, Protestant travelers to Spain, sometimes even foreign dignitaries, fall into the iron grip of the Inquisition. Foreign sailors and merchants were indeed arrested by the Inquisition, and they were sometimes even tortured by the Inquisition, which sounds very unjust, but they were Protestants, and they were fair game. While Spain may have triumphed over Protestantism, it remains powerless against the effects of that other German invention, the printing press. By the end of the 16th century, books and pamphlets supposedly written by victims of the Spanish Inquisition do brisk business throughout Europe. Protestant leaders hoping to turn the world against Catholic Spain exploit these horrific tales of torture, imprisonment, and death. The ropes, which were of small size, cut through the prisoner's flesh to the bone, making the blood to gush out at eight different places, thus bound at a time. As the prisoner persisted in not making any confession of what the inquisitors required, the ropes were drawn in this manner four times successively. John Fox, The Book of Martyrs. Bad Inquisition publicity isn't the only scandal facing the Catholic Church. In 1542, Rome is rocked by the news that Bernardino Ochino, leader of the admirably austere, pious Capuchin order of Catholic priests, has fled Italy to embrace Protestantism. The defection of Ochino, one of the Church's most admired figureheads, finally motivates the Pope to take action. Papacy responds to this kind of scandal by creating a, what is hoped, a more efficient way of tracking heretics and stopping them before they become dangerous or embarrassing. On July 4th, Pope Paul III orders the establishment of the Roman Inquisition, the first Inquisition on Italian soil in over 200 years. The Holy Office is to be run by a commission of six cardinals, but unlike the Spanish version, which was directed by the Crown, the Roman Inquisition's power will be solely in the hands of the Pope. Whatever the Roman Inquisition did wrong, it's impossible to say that it wasn't the papacy who did it. During the 16th century, the Roman Inquisition holds considerable prestige and political command. Popes Paul IV and Pius V rise to power after serving the church as inquisitors. Though both their regimes are bloody in terms of how many Protestants they put to death, recent studies show that the Roman Inquisition pioneered a number of judicial reforms that were predecessors of our modern legal system. Prisoners of the Roman Inquisition could retain an attorney and even summon friendly witnesses on their own behalf. 300 years before the concept of the public defender is invented, the Roman Inquisition even provided an attorney free of charge to indigent defendants. The Inquisition at least listens, purports to listen, to the defendants' excuses uh, in ways that the other court systems of that time do not. Secular justice was nastier in many ways than the holy offices. They tortured people more ruthlessly. They uh, were quicker to condemn you. People don't die under torture in the Inquisition systems. They do in secular courts. The Roman Inquisition's attack on Protestantism involves more than arrests, punishment, and executions. In 1559, the Vatican releases its Index of Prohibited Books, 
listing hundreds of books and authors considered dangerous to the faith or morals of good Catholics. Any citizen found with a banned book in his or her possession is subject to arrest. Some authors find their works listed on an index simply because a stray sentence or two is found to be defective. Sir Thomas More, the English statesman who ironically is beheaded for his allegiance to the Catholic faith, is also a banned author. Uh, there were uh, certain passages in his, in his books which the index said, you may read this book, but you must cut out this passage. And so many famous people, yes, were on the index and were therefore prohibited. Historians question whether the indices had any real impact. There are literally thousands of titles per index, and except for a handful of inquisitors and bishops, few people know exactly what is prohibited. From my own researches, I've proved that in Catalonia, for example, nobody pays any attention to the index, that right through the 16th century, the bookshops of Barcelona sell publicly books which are on the index of prohibited books, but they pretend they don't know about it. As an instrument of censorship, the index of prohibited books turns out to have more bark than bite. But there can be no question that the Roman Inquisition had a repressive effect on intellectual and scientific ideas and destroyed the lives and legacies of some of the greatest thinkers of the Renaissance. Giordano Bruno was one of the most eccentric geniuses of the 16th century. Part philosopher, part madman, his vision of the cosmos, considered far-fetched in its day, actually anticipated our modern conception of the solar system. Bruno was a visionary. He was someone who saw himself almost as a second coming of Christ, although in fact he had, and, uh, he had some doubts about the divinity of Christ, which was one of the things that was held against him. Bruno's most famous treatise, published in 1584, quickly earns him a place on the Roman index. Called On the Infinite Universe and Worlds, it is an odd melding of mysticism and Copernican astronomy. Bruno theorizes that there is intelligent life on worlds just beyond the stars. He teaches that the unification of all religions, Islam and Judaism included, offers the only salvation for mankind. These heretical beliefs create animosity in Catholics and Protestants alike. In those days of religious tension, somebody like Bruno appears like a super threat because in fact he seems to reject almost all the important features of Christianity. For 15 years, Bruno carefully avoids the Roman Inquisition by simply staying out of Italy. But in 1591, a rich patron convinces Bruno to come to Venice and then betrays him to the Holy Office. Bruno's incarceration and trial drag on for seven years, during which time the Roman tribunal practically begs him to abandon his heretical beliefs. He refuses. It would have seemed like a repudiation of his entire life. And so for a man like Bruno, who was supremely confident in his own powers, it would have been almost impossible, I really think, for him to have done other than what he did in the end. Perhaps your fear in passing judgment on me is greater than mine in receiving it. Giordano Bruno. Pope Clement VIII is so angered at Bruno's obstinacy that he personally sentences him to death. On February 8, 1600, Bruno is taken to Campo di Fiori in the heart of Rome and burned alive. Today, a statue to him erected in 1829 marks the spot. Another of the Renaissance's intellectuals, Galileo Galilei, also draws the Inquisition's wrath. By the time he built the first of his famous telescopes in 1609, Galileo was already a world-renowned experimental physicist and professor of mathematics. In 1613, he publishes two new books, The Starry Messenger and Sunspot Letters, in which he champions the Copernican theory that the Earth moves not only on its axis, but also around the sun once a year. Outraged officials of the Inquisition denounce Galileo's beliefs as heretical, 
citing numerous passages in the Holy Scriptures that describe the earth as stationary and the center of the universe. The cardinals really couldn't care much which went around what. They were very much concerned about the question of Scripture, and Galileo seemed to be challenging them on those grounds, very dangerous grounds at the time. In 1616, Galileo avoids trial and punishment by the Roman Inquisition when he agrees to stop teaching his groundbreaking planetary theories. Nevertheless, 16 years later, encouraged by the fact that his old friend and admirer, Cardinal Barberini, is now Pope Urban VIII, the celebrated scientist publishes a new manifesto that reinforces his former view. This time, Galileo badly miscalculates, incurring not only the wrath of the Inquisition, but the ire of his former ally, the Pope. And that factor, the Pope's personal animosity, personal opposition, was, I think, in large part responsible for the way in which the Holy Office proceeded from then onwards. He was clearly pushing them. Galileo is charged with heresy. In January 1633, after making a last will and testament, the 68-year-old astronomer travels to Rome to face the Inquisition. They ask all kinds of questions. How did you come to write this book? Why did you write it? Aren't you defending the view in there that has been said to be contrary to scripture and so on? He kept basically denying his guilt which was probably not the best strategy in, in the circumstances of the trial. After three months of interrogation by the Inquisition, including threat of torture, a plea bargain is worked out. In return for dropping the most serious charges, Galileo will admit error and plead guilty to the lesser offense of publicly defending Copernicanism. On June 21st, 1632, at a public ceremony in Rome, Galileo's sentence is pronounced, and he recants his scientific beliefs. With a sincere heart and unfeigned faith, I abjure, curse, and detest the above-mentioned errors and heresies. Galileo Galilei. Over the years, there's been a tremendous amount of debate, uh, particularly during the last century, as to what Galileo should have done. It's important to remember that if he had actually refused to abjure, if he had not accepted that offer, I mean, if he had said, no, I still believe in the Copernican system, he actually could have been executed. It's rather easy 200 years later to sit back and say, well, he should have braved it out and uh, simply defied them and allowed himself perhaps to be burned at the stake. After his recantation, the Pope sentences Galileo to a unique punishment, to return to Venice then remain under house arrest for the remainder of his life. The old scientist dies quietly nine years later at the age of 77. Legend has it, however, that immediately after taking his forced oath, Galileo whispered to a friend, the earth moves for all that. In 1992, Pope John Paul II officially announces that the church had indeed erred in 1633 when it condemned the father of modern science as a heretic. It was a pity that he wasn't heard, that there was no theologian at the time who could have seen it clearly. The mistake was committed by the ones who judged Galileo. The 17th and 18th centuries mark a period of decline for all inquisitions. In Spain, except for the occasional need to root out conversos accused of secretly practicing Judaism, the Spanish Inquisition narrows its focus to prosecuting unacceptable personal behavior like homosexuality, bigamy and adultery, as well as crimes of the clergy. The punishment ceremonies, autos de fa, continue sporadically into the 18th century. The prestige of the Inquisition, however, is tarnished when Philip V, the first Bourbon king of Spain, expressly refuses to attend an auto held in honor of his coronation. The Inquisition is seen increasingly by Spaniards themselves as an out-to-date instrument. It therefore uh, virtually uh, doesn't exist after about the year 1730. 
Inspired by the ideals and reforms of the Enlightenment, Portugal begins to slowly dismantle its office of inquisition. By 1773, the auto de fe is outlawed and all distinctions between old Christians and new Christians are removed from Portuguese law books. It takes the invasion of Italy and Spain by Napoleon's forces to put the final nail in the Inquisition's coffin. One of the first acts of the French regime that marches into Madrid in 1808 is to abolish the Inquisition, confiscate its property, and haul away every archive they can find. Napoleon goes even further in Rome, where he takes prisoner not only the archives, but the Pope himself. In 1814, the Napoleonic Empire itself crumbles, and Pope Pius VII returns safely to Rome. Finally, in 1820, the Spanish Inquisition is outlawed entirely. Upon hearing the news, mobs of citizens storm the palace, burning and destroying Inquisition records. Some people whose relatives had been tried by the Inquisition did not want that to be generally known, so they actually stole them and got rid of them. Despite such overwhelming evidence, the papacy refuses to acknowledge that the end of the Inquisition is inevitable. So the Roman Inquisition continues, in theory, if not actual practice, for another 150 years. In 1965, Pope Paul VI reorganizes the Holy Office and renames it the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. It exists to the present day, but acts only in an advisory fashion on ecclesiastical matters. It does not make inquiries, nor does it enforce church doctrine. Since the end of the Inquisition proper, countless myths and inaccuracies have sprung up about its purpose and its practices. Discoveries of previously unseen records, as well as the recently opened Inquisition archives in Vatican City, have helped debunk many of them. For example, some accepted tallies of people burned at the stake have now been proven to be greatly exaggerated. People have said 200 people were burned at the stake. In reality, of those 200, maybe three were burned in person and maybe 270 were burned in effigy. So bit by bit, we have brought the Inquisition down to reality in terms of how many people it killed. Many centuries were necessary to understand that something was wrong. We have to take into consideration the context and the mentality. Many people thought of the Inquisition as a necessary practice, and even if it wasn't very nice, it was accepted. But many other scholars warn that a revisionist view of the Inquisition may be taking us too far in the wrong direction. It was an evil institution. When you add it all up, I would argue the Inquisition is every bit as vicious as it has been painted, and that uh, we don't need a um, whitewashing of the Inquisition uh, any more than we need Holocaust revisionism. And it did torture people. It did levy heavy fines, it did burn people. There were fanatic theologians in the Inquisition. There were anti-Semites in the Inquisition. That's undeniable. There is one fact that cannot be denied, that although the Inquisition may have been conceived for human good, more often than not, it caused untold suffering and pain. Inquisitions existed for nearly six centuries, thriving on the need for one group to impose its ideas and will upon others. And this need, for some, still remains. I think the only lesson to be learned from the Inquisition is not to think of it as unique. It is a recurrent phenomenon, recurrent in the history of all countries, uh, because it was a normal phenomenon. 
it is an international phenomenon, but more than that, it is innate in the human condition to use inquisitions as a method of imposing our cultural preferences. The danger is always there when a society is threatened, whether that society is a religious society like the Catholic Church in the 16th century or a nation state in the 20th, when that society is challenged, it then it very frequently makes a violent response to that and a response that is often not bound by law. So I think that this sort of thing, uh, uh, that this kind of reaction to threat is as old as humankind and undoubtedly will go on into the future. In recent years, the Catholic Church has shown a willingness to apologize for its past conduct. The Pope has expressed deep regret that the Vatican failed to do enough during the Holocaust. He's also issued a formal request for forgiveness. Church leaders say they want to start the new millennium with a clear conscience. For more information on the Inquisition, please visit our website at historychannel.com.